Welcome ladies and gents, Chris Andre here. You can find me at BetBoxing on Twitter, or of course you can subscribe to the channel, Let's Talk Boxing. Technical breakdown video here, we're going to break down all of the fights that are coming up this weekend that are big fights that I'm looking forward to. Can't wait, I think it's a terrific weekend of boxing. Um, if it drags on, I'll put timestamps for each of the fights, you can jump straight to them. I know you dudes have all got attention deficit issues these days, so you're not going to want to watch a long video. Maybe you want to watch some of the fights, breakdowns, and you can do that and not the others. Or you might want to watch a couple now, come back later and be able to jump straight to the point let's start off with talking about Golovkin though and Moretta this is a fight I can't wait for you know I think it's terrific a lot of people are upset at this I've seen a lot of people say things like I don't get it why isn't Golovkin fighting Andre why isn't he fighting Charlo you know this is a this is not a fight that I'm interested in you can't always look at things from an ethnocentric or a western centric perspective yes in the western world we would be including me more excited about Golovkin versus Andre or Golovkin versus Charlo right I get it I do however you have to understand, Gennady Golovkin, yes, his father is ethnic Russian, but he's also a very, very proud Kazakh, and his mother is Korean. Now, Kazakhstan and Korea are obviously nations of, of Asia. They're Asian nations in the depth of Asia. And Ryota Murata is a superstar in Japan. He's an Olympic gold medalist, world champion, a big star over there. He dresses the part, he looks the part, he's popular over there. So in Asia, this is a legacy-type fight, and a lot of people seem to be overlooking that. You know, it's kind of like over here in the UK, we were really excited about Brook Khan recently. A lot of people were moaning his past his sell-by date. And when it came around, we couldn't wait for it, right? And a lot of people are saying, listen, it's a somewhat of a career-defining fight for Kell Brook. Well, the Americans didn't see it that way. They weren't interested. They saw it as two washed-up guys. But here it was massive. And it's not just in that particular case. Take Australia, for instance, when Jeff Horn was fighting the likes of Anthony Mundine or he was fighting uh, Zarafa. These were massive fights in Australia, big domestic clashes. In the Western world, in America, people weren't as interested in seeing Jeff Horn fight Mundine, for instance, right? Two guys that you, a lot of people saw as past their sell-by date and so on and so forth. Well, this is another case, though, of a legacy fight in Asia, in the global boxing market. Gennady Golovkin turned 40 today. Happy birthday to Golovkin. Murata, a lot of people are saying, listen, he's no spring chicken. He's 36 years old. He's been inactive even longer than Golovkin. His last fight was against Stephen Butler back in December 2019. Golovkin's last fight was against Sheremeta in December 2020. So he's been even more inactive. This is true, but I believe the style of Murata is going to be less affected by the inactivity. We'll get to that in a moment. But also 36 years old, which is what Murata is, is a big gap between that and 40. A lot of people say, oh, it sounds old. Yeah, okay, maybe. But four years ago, when Golovkin was 36, that was the second fight against Gennady, against the Canelo Alvarez. So four years is a long time, right? Um, also, Murata is the sort of guy who is somewhat of a size guy. Yes, he's an Olympic gold medalist and what have you, but he's the sort of guy that will cover up, take shots, be very cautious in that way, and then try and step in with big flurries of shots. And he likes to use his size and impose his size and break you down. And he's only lost a couple of fights. One of them was a very controversial decision to Hassan and Dam and Jikum. And he got a... He got his revenge in the in the follow-up fight where he knocked him out in round seven. Similar thing happened with Brandt. He lost a unanimous decision in that fight where he was outboxed. He was outworked. And in the second fight, again, he's covering up, but he starts to really let go of his hands early and he gets Rob Brandt out of there in the second round. So Morata's the sort of guy who can be very, very dangerous. And he's the sort of guy who will rectify quite violently errors that have gone wrong in his career so this is no guy this guy's no joke you know a lot of people talk about him in the in the u.s and in the west as though he's just like a you know a, a weak title holder a bum so to speak uh, you got to put, put a bit of respect on that name you know he's he's he's, he's done his his thing and yes i'm not suggesting he's he's a superstar by any stretch of the imagination outside of asia but he is one there so this is a legacy fight for golovkin golovkin who uses that jab and likes to come in a lot behind that jab and whipping left hooks to the body and stuff like that when you're working against golovkin he likes to cover up and he'll tuck up and he'll tuck his chin and he'll curve his back as well so he covers the ribs there aren't much of the ribs to aim at and he'll offer you the top of his forehead where the hairline is and that's the hardest part of the human skull and it's very difficult to knock a man out by punching him on that part of the skull so there's not much to aim at where you can hurt him his temples are covered his chin's tucked uh, his ribs are protected by his elbows he's very good at doing that and when you finish your work as you try to exit the pocket or reset or just stay in the pocket the moment you finish when there's a gap he then starts to hunt and that's what Golovkin does so he's forcing you to work very very hard because you're either working running or taking abuse 
right? Morata, though, is the sort of guy, like I said, who also likes to cover and then go to work. So you could end up seeing a fight here where it will be a case of I go, you go, I go, you go, and you're, you're exchanging flurries. And Riata is imposing, man, and he breaks guys down. 13 knockouts out of his 16 wins. His two defeats have been avenged by knockouts, right? So he's a dangerous dude. He is a big man and a dangerous guy. This is going to be a good fight, potentially, a real barn burner, whichever way it goes. It's hard to judge Golovkin because he has been out for so long and it's hard to judge Morata. But like I said, I don't believe Morata's style is affected quite as negatively by the inactivity because he is that imposing size guy that will let you work and he goes to work. Whereas because Golovkin's looking to time you with the jab and judge the distance with that and disguise the left hook, particularly to the body. And if you decide to come at him, he can do what he did against Lemieux and against uh, Canelo in the second fight. He can get on that back foot, pump out a ramrod jab that snaps your head back it's almost like a power shot for other fighters and then with him it's a jab but it's all about that distance control and so if he's lost a little bit of that because of inactivity and he's a little bit rusty that could affect Golovkin also Golovkin since linking up with uh, Jonathan Banks and he started to like I said bring about this upper body movement and Abel Sanchez has been critical of that he gave an interview with Marcos Villegas and he was saying how although he thinks Banks is a really good trainer he's not trying to undermine him as a trainer he doesn't agree with Gennady Golovkin's approach of trying to be more of a boxer puncher he feels that he should be a straight up hunter that he should put it on guys and that pressure that he he applies and the power and the monstrous strength he said physically speaking in terms of a wrestling match he's as strong as Baturbiev so he's saying listen this guy's you know he should be fighting like that he should be putting this to to good use so that's his approach well regardless of where you stand on that the fact of the matter is if you are going to be more of a boxer puncher with a you know relying a little bit more on upper body movement to be elusive well you need your sharpness so it's more likely to affect Golovkin if he approaches it in that way than Murata who you know is going to fight a certain way whatever he does and it's blood and guts and and thunder and blunt force trauma to try and take a guy out so that's something else you need to think about Golovkin could be affected more not just because of age but also because of the style. So inactivity and age could be affecting Golovkin. These are unknowns. If that is not the case though, and Golovkin is still the same guy that fought Jeremeta, he's still very accurate. And he will find gaps between the guard of um, uh, Murata. And because murata has got this big long body and the way he covers up and then from there, he often shoot down to the body without coming low to do that. So he'll leave himself open in quite a few areas. So I can imagine Golovkin's left hook really finding a home um, in those ribs but nonetheless Morata is very very durable so if I had to guess I'm guessing Gennady Golovkin will win the fight on points um, even though it is in Japan and um, if it is in Japan and it is a case of I go you go and they're exchanging with each other um, it'll be interesting to see what happens here are they going to go for the hometown guy or are the judges going to to go for the guy who's the bigger name and potentially there's a big fight on the horizon against Canelo Alvarez I believe Golovkin will probably get the decision let me know what you think now moving on from that let's talk about Sebastian Fundora and Erickson Lubin a fight I'm really excited to see to be honest with you I'm, I'm really big on Fundora I think he's a really good fighter you know he's the sort of guy the first time you see him you think to yourself this guy's a bit of a freak show right and he's going to eat a big right hand and over the top right hand or over the top left hand and he's just going to bowl over and if he doesn't eat one of those shots he's going to get destroyed to the ribs he's going to end up falling over and not being able to get up you can snap this guy in half right just by looking at him that's your your theory yeah, when you see him, this boy can fight. He can take a shot. And what I love about Fundora is the trajectory of his punches. There is a method to what he's done to make it really work well for him. You know, when you're a very tall guy and you're fighting someone who's a lot shorter, when you're jabbing, ideally, you want to come lower as well to keep them at bay, at range from almost like a spear. When you're punching down, when you're having to punch down, you're in a way giving up your height. And I'll explain what I mean by that. Imagine somebody is standing upright and they're up to your chest and you're going to stretch out to touch them. You then touch them and then you see how far they are. You measure the distance from them to yourself. Imagine he crouches really low where his head is almost by your your hips and as he comes in now you've got to touch the top of his head but it's because you've got to then point downwards instead of straight up when you do touch the top of his head if you then measure the distance between him and yourself he will be a lot closer to you you've shortened the distance by lowering your arm because you're not stretching out as far as you can you've lowered it to to a point right in front of you so what tends to happen is with taller guys something that i always say on this channel 
Height and reach is only an advantage if you're capable of maintaining range. So your feet and your distance control and things like that, your angles are vital. Otherwise, it's a disadvantage. If you cannot maintain your range when a guy's up on your chest, he's going to be swinging full rotations and he's going to be able to do it inside a smaller bracket. Whereas you're trying to punch into your chest, you're not going to be able to generate that same level of, of rotation as quickly so he's getting off big shots against you and you can't protect yourself you can't cover your entire head and your body and everything so unless you're going to tie up a lean and stuff like that but when you're not a big physically strong guy like fundora you're not he's not a big wide dude this isn't like trying to get on the inside of tyson fury if you're a heavyweight and then he knows how to tie you up and lean on you or against lawrence okoli for a cruiserweight Fondora is skinny. In a wrestling match, he might not be as physically strong as some of these other guys that he's facing at light like, middleweight. So uh, you're in a position whereby you can't really afford to do that. So what has he done? He's adapted. Instead of punching downwards, what he tends to do is, yes, he, he'll also drop the occasional downwards punch, but he's not afraid to bypass the jab and throw hooks, short hooks and short uppercuts. So he's saying to you, that's fine. If you want that pocket, you're going to come into that pocket. But I know that despite my aesthetics, I can take a shot and I carry pop. So now you're going to be eating short shots when you're there. And I can do this incessantly. I can, I've got a great engine. You're going to be in uppercuts. You're going to be in hooks. Lubin has this, this um, habit of leaving his uh, chin open when he throws his shots. Now, if he does throw a looping shot over the top he is quite rangy so he is a sort of guy the way he whoops that hook around it's not a tight hook when he throws it there's a bit of a loop on it right and so because of that if he can dip to the side he can bring that over the top left hand he's a southpaw so i can see the way in which he does this biomechanically to develop the power to go over the top i've got no doubt he can do that but one of the problems that he's going to have is because he does tend to leave that chin open, when he does start dipping to throw these over-the-top shots, he'll be getting caught too. Now, Fondora, we've not really seen him, his chin exposed or anything like that. I haven't anyway. I haven't seen every one of his fights, but from what I've seen, he can carry a shot. If Lubin is unable to knock this guy out, are you sure that he's going to be able to take these short, powerful, incessant shots from Fondora? These little uppercuts, these little hooks. Don't look at Fondora as some skinny dude and think, ah, hey, he's got no pop. This dude's got a 64% knockout ratio. He can, he can bang a little bit, right? He can, and he's incessant with it. And Lubin can be hurt. There are question marks about his chin. Yes, Charlo's a big puncher, we know that. But it was an uppercut that took him out of there in that first round as well. So... You know, there, there are elements here where I think Lubin is the uh, is a very talented guy. We know he's heavy-handed. 17 of his 24 wins are knockouts. We know he can loop those shots. We know he can adjust. He can go to the body. He can go to the head. He's a talented fighter. He's been in there with some good fighters too. But nonetheless, I feel as though Fundora's got a little bit too much going for him in terms of his overall attributes here, as well as the fact that, to me, he's a potential star in the making because he's a good kid, a nice kid. He comes across as so anyway. He's a really fun fighter to watch. And he's got a really, just aesthetically, an eye-catching presence about him. If you're a casual and you're flicking through the channels, you want to see this guy fight just because it's like a freak show. How can someone be six foot five, six foot six, and be a, a light middleweight? It's madness, right? So you're almost interested in seeing it because they're standing in the ring and one guy looks tiny compared to him. So they can build this guy up. He's likable, he's different, and he's a great fighter to watch. And the Sergio Garcia fight was a close fight, could have gone either way, and Sergio was really going to work. Um, Tom Carasone's scorecard of 115-113, I have no problem with it, you know, to, to Fondora. The other two cards from Lou Moret, 118-110, and Alejandro Rochin at 117-111 for me were terrible. But that's the point here. We're talking about another emerging A-side. If there's a close fight, I can't imagine Lou being getting it. Let me know what you think. I personally think Fondora will win this fight. Perhaps points, but ultimately I think Fondora will have enough to win this fight. Let me know what you think about that one. Let's talk about another return. Ryan Garcia, another hugely exciting fighter, of course. Beautiful laser-like jab. Ridiculous left hook. Very, very fast, very crisp, very powerful. Great timing with it. Um, a really dangerous guy. He fights a little bit tall, a little bit upright. Uh, and so that could be a potential problem for him. Um, he does shift his feet quite well, though. So when he's fighting tall, he can, he can sort of get away with that. Uh, I do want to see a little bit more rotation if he's going to continue to fight tall. You know, when that hook comes in, turn the shoulder, turn with it, start rolling with it, working on those things. I'm sure he will start to work on those things with Joe Goosen. Uh, with Eddie Reynoso, he started to introduce misdirection into his attacks, which is really 
great stuff from him because he's got the hand speed and the power. If he can start to shape up to throw a certain shot in a certain way and then change the direction of that shot, something Canelo is sensational at. And he picked up a lot of that, a lot of that from working with Ronoso. And that was what he did with the body shot to stop Luke Campbell. If he carries that on, I know he's left Ronoso and he's gone to Goosen, but you don't unlearn the knowledge you had. If he continues to work on that in the gym and adds a few more wrinkles, this could be a really dangerous guy. I know a lot of people are looking at him and saying, oh, he's a social media presence. This boy is a fighter. Make no mistake, he is quality. Ryan Garcia is quality. And listen, if they were all in it, if they had a lightweight uh, a super series tomorrow, I wouldn't be stunned if Ryan Garcia won it. Okay, a lot of people feel like, oh yeah, I'd have all the other top guys slight favorite against him, but he could potentially beat them on his day. Not necessarily. I think styles make fights and against some of them, I think he gets the better of them. Um, of all the American fighters, I think he's the one that has most chance against Lomachenko, for instance. I also can imagine how over a 12 round fight, he'd cause a lot of problems to Devin Haney. Early in the fight, I think Devin Haney would get the better of him. And in the amateurs, they're level. I think they're four apiece, but I think um, it's it's... 3-1 I think or something like that to Devin Haney 2-1 to Devin Haney in the more recent fight since they've been older but over a short period uh, you know a short fight of, of an amateur fight where Haney's able to change levels and give him different looks that can work but Haney does tend to gas we've seen him gas we saw him get hurt late on against Linares we saw him gas against Jojo Diaz if he started to gas late on against Ryan Garcia you might be surviving against those guys. You're not necessarily surviving against Ryan Garcia because his power seems to carry late. He seems to have a good engine. And uh, a lot of people talk about Cambosos having a, a you know a gritty style and maybe a puncher's chance Cam against Haney. Cambosos is a very slick counter-punching pressure fighter. He's not a big puncher. It's overstated his power. And Devin Haney's lack of power is also overstated. Devin Haney's got more pop than people give him credit for. He's not a monster puncher, but he's crisp. Ryan Garcia though he can knock people out clean you know he's he's a puncher so you know how do you survive against that if you aren't moving as well and you know if, if you're if you're leaving yourself open to being shots over to shots like that over 12 rounds so Ryan Garcia is dangerous I'm not saying he would beat Haney or he would beat Tank or Cambosos or Lomachenko or any of them but he's got the ability to he's a top fighter he just needs to start marrying it all together and we need to see him a little bit more consistent now and we need to see him focus on boxing primarily above anything else not that he should ever give up the rest of it because that's what could help make him the face of boxing one day but he's in there against Emmanuel Targo and I hadn't seen Targo fight before up until last night when I did a little bit of film study I watched his fight against Menard I also saw some short footage of him fighting um in Africa a, a couple of fighters there I can't remember their names off the top of, me, top of my head but I was watching him do a little bit of work and this boy can actually fight I was surprised I mean Listen, he's with Javier Centeno, who's one of the top trainers in the sport. The guy doesn't get credit, as I've said in my previous videos. Uh, he's almost like the Grant Smith of, of boxing. Grant Smith, rather, is the British version of him. He's got George Cambosos. He's got uh, Zander Zayas, an elite-level prospect. And he's got Emmanuel Targo, who is a very good fighter, who's very awkward. And he's in the gym, therefore, with a lot of good fighters. He's done 60 rounds of sparring uh, with George Cambosos ahead of his last outing. So this is a guy who is operating with some good guys, man. And you can see some of the work he does. Targo is not a puncher. And this is potentially a problem he's going to have against Ryan Garcia. But his feet are ex excellent. They're really, really good. He, he changes direction very well. He gets you to reset very well. He changes levels well. He's up and down and changes levels. So it makes him quite hard to hit. Uh, he's giving you different looks consistently, getting you to reset. I'd really like to see him in there against a whole bunch of guys, really. But um, Ryan Garcia as well might be all wrong for Targo. Just because one of the things he has, he, he, he will change levels, but he'll come low and he'll shoot these long arms. And they're almost like jabs, regardless of the shot he's throwing. It, 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 they're very, very straight shots. There isn't much of a loop on, on something that he throws, but he'll, he'll have a little, almost like a touching jab. And so a counter puncher, like uh, Cambosos say, he won't give him much to counter. So Cambosos will have to go on the hunt. So stylistically, he could cause Cambosos some issues early on. I can imagine their sparring sessions being really interesting technical affairs. And then if Cambosos has to put on his foot on the gas and get inside, that's when he starts to get the better of Targo because Targo on the inside has some limitations. Um, he's not a great inside fighter. He's rangy arms. He doesn't know how to deal with uh, the positioning of the opponent's hands and stuff like that. There are errors that he makes. But at range... He will get you to reset consistently. He'll throw these long arms out. And when he's up against Ryan Garcia, who's tall, it's going to be interesting for two reasons. Number one, 
where it, because he doesn't have that power, I'm not sure he's going to be able to come in low and then come upstairs with a big shot the way Luke Campbell did to try and take Ryan out. In which case, he's going to have to do the majority of his good work at range. And because Ryan's tall and he's got that fast left hand, which is very accurate and great with the timing, when you look at guys that seek to jump in on him, look how well he times them with that hook and that left hand. Well, if though, this is the key element here, if he can be getting Ryan to reset and he's catching him by punching up, while he stays low and he's on the outside, low though, not too low to affect his mobility because his feet are his best element. He's got to be able to change that, uh, the level and touch him and move, touch him and move. This could be a real test for Ryan Garcia. Like seriously, Manuel Otago, from what I've seen, is a good fighter. So respect to Ryan Garcia. The odds are really surprising. Now, listen, I've only seen him fight one and a half fights in total. One full fight and then a couple of rounds for another couple of fights. It could be that I've just not had the time to do proper film study on Targo. And had I done so, I'd actually say actually there are a lot more gaps here. But from what I've seen, he's an awkward guy, man. He can box a little bit. And this is going to be interesting. So respect to Ryan Garcia for making this a comeback fight. Because he could have fought a bum instead of a guy who's awkward, who's talented, and who has a brilliant trainer and works in the gym against top guys as a comeback fight that's dangerous man Targo could be a sleeper here so I'm looking forward to that fight let me know what you think about that another couple of fights I'm not going to give a prediction on these because I've not seen uh, Shane Mosley Jr. in a long time but from what I had last seen he could be a, a fun fighter to watch and we know Gabriel Rosado is a fun fighter that will be a bit of a barn burner so make sure you watch that I think that they'll be open in the card or or they'll be early on in the card but that'll be a good fight to watch um, you've also got from what I've seen in the past I would lean towards Rosado but um, who knows how Shane Mosley's developed I've not seen him in a long time Tony Harrison lost his head the other night against uh, Arias Arias threw something onto the stage and he decided to run off and try and punch Arias this was after an argument people got in the way that was a, a you know almost a, a volatile situation there we know Harrison's got a really nice jab um He's up against Sergio Garcia, who's very, very active. And I expect this to be a really good boxing match. At this stage of their careers, from what I've seen, I think Garcia will outwork him. I think he was unlucky not to get a result against Fundora. Not necessarily a problem with that. It could have gone either way. There's no doubt about that. But that engine that he has, that volume and really good boxing skills, I think he might just outwork Tony Harrison. But that's going to be a good fight for the purist. I think a lot of people are going to like some of the, the, the stuff on show there from a sheer boxing perspective. Let me know what you think about all the fights we've chatted about. Thanks for watching, everyone. Let me know what your predictions are. Chat to you soon. Take care. God bless.